This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Tom Standage, who is the deputy editor of The Economist, and their, I guess, resident futurist, <laughs> if I can call you that, uh, but also the author of a whole bunch of books. Um, the most recent book is called a, a Brief History of Motion from the Wheel to the Car to What Comes Next. And uh, the other books are similar in format, right? You've got the Writing on the Wall, which is, I guess, a history of social media. We've got Edible History of Humanity, which is, is obvious what that's a history of. Um, we've also got uh, History of the World in Six Glasses, um, The Turk, um, The Life and Times of the Famous 18th Century Chess Playing Machine, and the Victorian Internet, plus a couple of these other edited volumes. Welcome, Tom. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So, look, uh, a lot of these books, I mean, they follow a similar format. And uh, I wanted maybe to kind of get some insight into, first of all, why you use this format and then how you got so interested in history, right? Because, I mean, you're, you're a computer science engineering uh, alum, uh, and yet every single one of these books, right, tries to help us understand the past and potentially the future by doing a, a deep dive into the past. So where did you acquire your kind of curiosity about the um, origin stories <laughs> or the, the history yeah, yeah. No, of exactly. these, these phenomena? So essentially these books tell the same joke over and over again, which is sort of here is a thing there's a thing that's that's new and exciting today and everyone thinks it's never happened before but here is a thing from the past that's actually just the same and look everyone reacted to it in just the same way whether it's romans on social media or victorians on the internet or you know what people said about about how cars were gonna when when they replaced uh horse-drawn carriages it was gonna mean there was no more traffic and no more accidents and no more pollution which sounds just like what people say about self-driving cars today so um so yes yeah, the same it's the same joke over and over again and i suppose the um, and I did this initially, the Victorian Internet was my first book 25 years ago, so in 1998. Um, and I think the, the logic to it is what I essentially tried to see the present in the past and the past in the present. And when you do that, I think um, the, the past becomes more relatable and the people in the past become more relatable if you can see that actually they react to and it's generally to technologies i treat food and drink essentially as technologies mm -hmm. um in the same way they become sort of more understandable but then at the same time the fact that they react in the same way sort of helps us understand ourselves and shows that human nature doesn't change and that technologies come and go but we sort of are the same but but the other thing is if that's true um and that's sort of invariant over time then that also helps us look into the future and really what's happening here is that i'm obsessed with what the future looks like so yes i edit our annual at the economist which is called the world ahead and it comes out every november and it's our sort of best guesses as to what's going to happen in the coming year um and more generally i think i try and work out what the future looks like in three ways um, one of them is to look in the past, as I do with my books, and I do that with my author's hat on. Then, um, as a journalist, I look in the present. So what we call edge cases. So things that are pieces of the future that are present in 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 the world today. So the famous um, quote from William Gibson, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed, um, is you know clearly true and as a technology journalist which is what i've spent most of my career doing i go to places where you can see the future now whether that's going to you know the the cities that have self-driving cars in them or whether i remember going to tokyo in 2001 to see phones with color screens and cameras that you could download apps onto because you know they mm -hmm. first appeared in in uh, japan and south korea so you could see um, the future in those edge cases so so there are places you can look for it in the past there's places you can look for it in the present and then the other place i look for it is in the futures the imagined futures of science fiction so i read a lot of science fiction and of course science fiction is not really about the future it's usually about the present it's usually social commentary on what's happening now um under the cover of you know futuristic stories taking ideas to their logical conclusions and so on so um so that essentially all of those three things um scratch the itch that i have of wanting to know what the future is going to look like and uh so that's really what joins them all together yeah i mean it, it almost seems to imply that there is a um science of social evolution right you know that uh there are these trends and processes in terms of how humans interact with technological change which 
which, which are constant over time. I mean, I remember there was a conference, I think at the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago, where they surveyed all of these folks. The conference was on innovation, and they asked everybody, you know, what's the number one topic you need to study if you want to understand innovation? And I think the, the, the modal answer was history, right, which cheered me on because I'm, I'm an historian. I was trained as a historian. And, um, and I remember um, I used to teach a course called Financial History. Now I teach a course called FinTech. Mm. And they're, they're pretty much the same course because for each thing, whether it was, you know, micro lending or payments, you know, I'd always start off with how did they solve these problems in the past and how are we solving them in, in the present? And, yeah, exactly. I, guess the, I think that's, so, I think I mean, that's exactly is, right. Yeah. I mean, is there, is there sort of a, um, I don't know, a, a science of understanding how, how change happens and how humans respond to change? Well, I, I, sense I if, would, what would it be called if we had that? Well, exactly. Psychohistory, right? That's the um, that's yeah. the uh, Asimov foundation answer. So that you can sort of turn history into a science. And this is what, you know, Paul Krugman says made him want to become an economist because he realized that economics is the closest thing we have to a sort of science of human behavior. And obviously it's, you know, very very flawed it doesn't work terribly well but um but you know i think uh nobody would say history is a science and i also think that um you know the old the old saying that history doesn't repeat itself but it does rhyme i think you can get clues uh and i probably go you know far, further than most in that i use these historical analogies and a lot of people say well that's you know problematic as well history argument by analogy is not very rigorous and and so on but really what i'm trying to do is I'm trying to show um, I'm really arguing against the uh, the sort of this has never happened before. This is going to change everything. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it's changing uh, the thing. I, the thing that really annoys me that um, that is sort of my motivation for doing this is that very often technology is blamed for the bad uses that people make of technology. So I remember when I was, um, you know, my career, when I started my career as a journalist and my ticket into journalism, because, yes, I went to Oxford in the late 1980s to study computer science because I wanted to build AIs. I'd read all this sci fi and I get to Oxford and discover and I've been tinkering with, you know, language models and chatbots and stuff as a teenager but they're rubbish and you've only got 32k of ram on your computer and you know so i'm thinking right i get to oxford and they'll know how to do this and we'll have big computers and actually they didn't know how to do it either that was the depth of the ai winter um symbolic ai as a as a sort of approach had run into the sand um and it was it was very disappointing but one of the things i did learn to do at, at, at university was use the internet and um it turned out that there was no one in the media who really knew about it in in britain in the early 90s and so i ended up working uh, at the guardian and then the daily telegraph and then the economist and the, you know basically writing about the internet was my ticket um into journalism um and I say that just because um, one of the kinds of stories that there was, a, there was a lot of about in those days, the early days of the Internet boom, was things like how the Internet is causing more divorce um, or you know, how the Internet is you know, causing problem X and problem Y. And the reason I right. wrote the Victorian Internet um, originally was that I wanted to show that things like cybercrime and online weddings and blaming communications technology for your wife running off with another man um has been going on for as long as there has been computer uh, you know communications technology my favorite example of this which is in the victorian internet is the first ever sort of cyber attack it's the first attack on a um on an information network it happens in 1834 and it happens it's even before electric telegraph so it happens on the on the mechanical telegraph the sort of semaphore telegraph that was uh that covered france um napoleon was a big fan and he built this sort of national network and it was used for military communications um but some very enterprising brothers figured out a way to basically introduce um, a certain pattern of errors into military communications that allowed them to transmit sort of hidden within these errors um, information about how the government bond market was moving from <laughs> Paris to Bordeaux. And that meant that they got the news the same day and everyone else in the Bordeaux exchange got it two days later. So they could then place you know, their bets and, uh, accordingly. And this went on for two years. And um, eventually they were caught because one of their accomplices got ill and tried to recruit someone else to uh, you know take over their part of the scam and they blew the whistle and and so forth but there was then no law that these brothers could be charged uh, you know under because it wasn't illegal to you know making illegal use of a government data network was not the kind of thing that people had laws against in 1834 but the point is this is the very first data network in history and it's also where you get the first cyber attack and i think that tells you that this is sort of um human nature is what it is i did similarly you know i have lots of other examples of scams and online romances and online weddings and you know 
human nature is what it is. And um, I like to say that technologies come and go, but they they push the same old buttons in our Stone Age brains. And I don't think technology changes human nature. I think it acts as a sort of magnifier or amplifier, and it amplifies the good tendencies and the bad tendencies. And what tends to happen is that when it amplifies the bad tendencies, people say, oh, look, the technology has made us into worse people. And if we banned this technology, then we'd all go back to a sort of state of purity that we were in before. And I'm really trying to argue against that. And there are so many examples of these sort of moral panics. And it's not just technology. It's, you know, comic books will turn you into a drug dealer. Um, you know, uh, waltzing. There was a There was a big concern about waltzing in the 1820s it was going to you know cause women to become promiscuous and so these sorts of stupid um, moral panics um, go back a very long way and and, uh, and really what I'm trying to say is look people are people and I think they've basically been the same since at least the Neolithic period and um, the technologies come and go and they have these very predictable outcomes and I'm going to show you what they are and then the idea is that next time you know when we have a big moral panic in three or four years that you know the children are, are doing these things in virtual reality and it's all Mark Zuckerberg's fault or whatever um, that we'll say actually we've seen this we've seen this movie before well there's definitely a panic uh, that I've seen around the introduction of a smartphone and its impact uh, particularly on on young people and their attention spans and and so forth and yeah, see I think you know, that's just not I... true right if the, if it this is nonsense right because who somebody is reading all those Game of Thrones books and is reading Harry Potter and is binge watching entire series on Netflix young people do not have an attention span problem it's just not true um I mean you know binge watching series is I don't know I just don't know where this comes from what the smartphone allows you to do which you couldn't do before is if you had half a minute uh, with nothing to do, like you're on an escalator yeah. or you're in a lift or you're in a queue or you're waiting for a bus and you've got two minutes, right? You can you can now send a message or you can play a game or you can you could you could basically make use of that time that you couldn't make use of. Um, and the way smartphones work is you can pause in the middle of anything. You can just stop and then you can restart again. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, people do a lot of things that take a short amount of time because there are a lot of you know things you can now do in a short amount of time when previously you couldn't have done. I mean, you could have like, opened a book and read, but nobody used to get a book out and read you know one page on an escalator. But because you've got this thing with you all the time. So it, 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 it's expanded. It's allowed us to make use of those tiny moments of time that where we previously have not done anything but that doesn't mean that all interaction on phones is sort of very very um very very short and it doesn't mean that that sort of stopped you know anyone just because twitter exists doesn't mean people can't write essays anymore contrary to what has been suggested i just don't think that's true and uh, as i say there are there is enormous appetite for people complain when video games are only 30 hours long now because they want <laughs> them to be 70 or 80 I, mean, I haven't got time to play a 70 or 80 hour game i liked it when video games only took 30 hours to complete but um so there you go i'm a i'm a terrible i've got a short a short attention span only 30 hours but um you know there's so much evidence that people will um will spend enormous amounts of time consuming media that they're really engaged with that i just don't buy this short attention span thing at all yeah i'm, I'm uh, currently filming a online course we, we introduced an on we have a now an online mba right at, at berkeley and um i'm filming the strategy course at the moment and the the course designers and the um administrators have said you know we really want to keep all of your videos to under three minutes because no one will pay attention if it's more than three minutes right <laughs> i'm thinking wait these are the same people that are watching these hbo series right non-stop they're saying yeah, yeah. and also and podcasts i mean some Avatar. podcasts are, right, yeah. some podcasts are like, you know, there are several that are yeah or, or there are some there joe are, rogan you know, is three hours three long like, <laughs> there you go i mean and people will listen to this and it's you know it's hugely popular so i just i just think there's so much evidence for and films i mean oppenheim is like a hundred years long isn't it um i think it's three <laughs> yeah. hours or something but i mean you know and, and the, those marvel films they all go on forever as well so anyway i just uh, yeah there is so much evidence to the contrary and it's just the usual the technology is corrupting the young people narrative which we've heard for centuries so uh, yeah well, i don't buy it well speaking of attention span i mean the Economist, uh, in the years that you've been there, I mean, has seen tremendous growth. I was a subscriber to The Economist starting in 1980, and in the United States, and I don't think there—I think there was like 10,000 
subscribers i think are you know yeah no so that's the big run. that's the big shift that's happened since since then um was that um when you know until about yeah i think the late 70s uh, certainly the early 80s the majority of economist subscribers were in britain um yeah. and then there were some others around the world and now and i think this has been true since sometime in the 80s um the majority of our subscribers are in north america so the us and canada and um i think that's something like six seven hundred thousand out of the kind of 1.2 million or so um and then uh, and then sort of 200,000 in Britain and then about the same in continental Europe, I think. And then everyone else sort of everywhere else. But um, so I think part of the appeal of The Economist and the reason that we've sort of, um, you, you know, done well in recent years is that we have provided this external perspective on uh, US politics in particular um, and sort of a, a global view. Um, and, you know, the number of people who want that sort of global perspective seems to be going up. And, you know, you just have to look at the events of the past few years to see why knowing what else is going on elsewhere in the world and not just in your own country is sort of, you know, something you, you absolutely need to do now. So, um, so yeah, that we we were ahead on that one. And, and um, we're in this unusual position of being based in Britain. Um, we have about half our editorial staff in Britain. Um, and yet most of our you know, the majority of our readers not being in Britain. And it's funny, if you Google the expression more like The Economist, in quotes, um, you will find a succession of editors of Time and Newsweek saying that they are taking over and they're going to make their publication more like The Economist. Um, but then one thing they can't do is make their economy, make their publication not be American. <laughs> and um, right. and uh, so this is just, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just happened this way by chance. But um uh, but, you know, one of the things I think that makes us distinctive is the fact that we are, um, you know, to the majority of our readers, uh, sort of coming at them from a slightly different uh, cultural perspective. Yeah, I remember, when, I think when I first started reading it, the they had a British section and then a Europe section and then an America's section, which included the US and then kind of American like the survey, the it was cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, and, and exactly. It's just, it was sort of at the back, right? And, and that was sort of <laughs> where I got my American news was was from this, usually a week late or so. But I mean, is there is there a, yeah, is exactly. there something similar between, you know, a, an historical perspective, where you're looking at things from sort of a, a one step remove um, temporally to a sort of global perspective where you're taking a look at things kind of one step removed from the all the stuff that's happening on the ground i mean is is that well i think i think one of the things that one of the things way? the I, sort of. I think one of the things the economist quite often does, because we have this global perspective, we sometimes call it the view from the moon. Um, it means we can do a comparative approach. So, you know, a very common story in any country is, you know, our education system is in a mess or our health system is in a mess. Yeah. What do we do about it? Um, oh, we need more money. And then we have a big argument about, you know, how we pay for it or whatever. Um, whereas the economist approach to covering those sorts of stories is, um, you know, this country is incredibly good at this thing. Um, what can other countries learn from it? Or what happened when this country tried to adopt that country's approach to health or education or whatever um so that sort of comparative approach that says you know we've seen this problem before um and those analogies you know why why does you know for example israel produce um so many startups it's i think the second or third um we've got the second or third largest number of um of companies on the nasdaq uh so what is it about israel and there are lots of theories about this and you know other countries say well we want to you know we want to punch above our weight in innovation like israel does now one of the reasons is that they have national service and so um that's quite difficult for other countries to copy unless they want to introduce national service another reason is that israel is a small country with a small population so um in britain you know entrepreneurs dream of conquering the british market um and then they they tend not to think any bigger than that that's a tiny market if you're in Estonia or Israel so um, startups in those countries tend to be they you know it's, it's uh, you tend to get startups in Israel that are Tel Aviv and Palo Alto from day one um, and so, so they're sort of inherently international so I think these sorts of comparative approaches are something that we do and that's sort of what um, I do with history as well because I'm trying to do pattern matching across mm -hmm across time rather than across space um and you know there are there are lots of historical approaches to doing that where you can compare you know the rise and fall of empires or you can compare you know different things that happen in different places or in different times and say what's similar what's different what does that tell us so um it is that kind of comparative pattern matching approach and i think um you know there is a certain amount of uh, you know my history is quite journalistic you know i'm not a historian by training i'm an engineer um and uh you know my daughter who's a you know just done a master's in classics um uh you know 
she derides things that I write, she'll say that's a journalistic flourish um, because, you know, <laughs> because in journalism, our job is to simplify, then exaggerate as a as a mm-hmm. um, as a former editor, of the economist once put it. And um, and I think, you know, I'm doing a certain amount of that. It, it, my history is, you know, it's not going to go into all of the nuances and details that a um, you know, historical monograph is going to go into. But what I'm trying to do is find the the broader shapes, the bigger picture. And that's what we're doing in journalism. And that's what I'm trying to do in history as well well i guess one of the questions would be do can journalists see things that professional historians can't see i mean when i was reading um the edible history of humanity again recently um it actually made me think of fernand braudel and i don't know if anybody's ever made that comparison <laughs> you know between you and oh and no fernand i read braudel, i used it i i read no exactly no, I've read. I don't think they have, but I mean, obviously, I read. You know, I read his um, some of his works when I was researching my books, um, and I think the um, that that whole question. Um, you know, people say that specialism in academia means that people know more and more about less and less, and journalists, by their nature, have to be generally have to be generalists i think i mean there are journalists who spend i mean i've spent you know most of my career actually focusing on on tech but um and i have some colleagues who are you know experts on russia or china or whatever but particularly at the economist um we we do more than other publications we do stir the pot and we move people from subjects Mm. that they know a lot about to subjects they know nothing about and we sort of parachute them in and say look you're a smart person you'll ask uh, you know your questions will be dumb for the first week and then um, and then they'll get smarter. But also, actually, there are no dumb questions because when you come into a field for the first time and you go, well, hang on a minute, why is this happening? What's going on over there? Um, you know, why is this? I mean, I you know, parachuted in to cover telecoms in 2000. Um, and so I was like immediately, well, hang on, why is why are Europeans doing text messaging and Americans aren't? Mm-hmm. Um, and why has everyone just spent so much money on 3G licenses? And why, you know, so just basic, you know, when you when you arrive in, in a in a new sort of environment like that, you ask you ask different questions. So I think um, so I think journalism uh, is is sort of uh, structured very differently from from history and from academia because it's not generally about learning more and more and more about a thing. It's um, it's generally being able to pick things up quickly and um and so forth and there's been a really recent um, example of this or an example that's sort of come to the fore recently so i've been um i've been doing uh, you know we have quite a lot of people on the staff uh who are computer scientists and we've all been doing the ai coverage in the last you know Mm -hmm. few years um and you know i've enjoyed writing about ai sort of coming back to the subject that i studied at university all those years ago and now it works and you know all the things that you know what's changed, what hasn't, and etc. I find it fascinating, and I like. You know, I've been doing some some coding again recently, um, and one of the interesting things that we came across in our studies of uh, in in our reporting on on AI, um, and this sort of also goes connects up with my obsession with forecasting the future. Um, so we have a relationship with the super forecasting crowd. So that's Philip Tetlock. Um, and he, you know, he had this crack team of geopolitical forecasters and they, uh, the US government had a, you know, had this competition to see who could do geopolitical forecasting. And the super forecasters won by an enormous margin. They beat, you know, all the academics and all of the think tanks and all of the consultancies. And so, th- but, th- but then they thought, well, this could have been a fluke. Let's do it again. So they did it again the following year. The super forecasters won again by a huge margin. So at that point, the government said, said okay we'll just we'll fund you guys because you seem to be you seem to know what you're doing and they do a handful of forecasts for us each year uh, that go into the world ahead but the interesting thing about super forecasting is this idea that there are some people who are very good at um, coming to a subject even if they don't know very much about it and they're very good at setting aside their biases and their preconceptions and that's really what the skill of a forecaster is um, because sometimes you can know too much about something and you can be too invested in a particular viewpoint on something and that makes it you know hard to to change your mind um, and this is particularly relevant right now because of the argument about existential risk in AI so the the weird thing is that people who work on AI um, and it turns out it's not just AI. Um, in people who work in any field are much more likely to say that um, big changes, whether good or bad, are likely to big world changing things that are going to happen in that field um, than super forecasters are. And this is not surprising if I mean, this happens if you're in the military, if you work in the car industry, if you're asked to say, what's the probability that this big thing will happen? And it doesn't matter if it's a good or a bad thing. It's just a big thing. You're always going to overestimate the likelihood that the field you have devoted your life to will change the world. 
And in the case of existential risk, you then get a lot of AI people who say, yes, we think the um, the risk of you know AI destroying humanity is 10% by the end of this century or something like that. And then if you ask the super forecasters, who, by the way, have a much, you know, they have a they have a scored track record on how good they are at these sorts of things. Um, they put it at you know about a tenth of that level. Um, and it's not just AI. They've seen this across the board. Whenever they're brought in to validate predictions about an industry or a field or whatever, um, they always say, no, this is much less likely to happen. And then the experts say, but we're the experts in this field. We know about this. And the mm. super forecasters are like, fine, let's see what happens. And when you then score, you know, you do a whole bunch of forecasts about things that you know, are going to happen in the next year or two, or whatever. When you score people, you find that the super forecasters, the generalists, um, the people who are good at setting aside their cognitive biases are much better at it. Um, and so um, that, I think, is one of the things that has been has been happening. And um, I think that probably means that journalists are the right kind of people to do super forecasting. And in fact, we did a um, we did a half day course with the super forecasters. I got a small team of people internally because I wanted to just sort of try doing it myself. And they make you do this aptitude test. And they said that we had a, a we scored as a team as high as highly as anyone ever had on that on that test. So um, so I think that kind of um, uh, generalizing about things and not knowing so much that you can't change your mind uh, is uh, is exactly what journalists should be doing. And that, you know, that probably means that um, journalists aren't in a terrible position. They're in, they're in as good a position as anyone else to predict what's going to happen. Well, you know, all my students uh, say that they want to change the world. And so I guess now I have to kind of uh, disillusion them <laughs> and tell them they're not going to change. That's fine. They can. They can. It's just it's just when they say when when you say what's the probability that this thing will change the world, then um, then you should bear in mind that, you know, when when you devote your time to something, you know, if you ask people in the car industry, um, you know, how if people working on self-driving cars will give you a much, much more optimistic mm -hmm. uh, number for how quickly they're going to work than, you know, uh, impartial experts who just look at it and go, yeah, it's going to take longer than that. Well, it's interesting. I mean, what you're describing is sort of the journalistic sensibility because um, it's very similar to what it is that I'm trying to inculcate in my MBA classroom, right? So, you know, I tell my students over and over again, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And I even award, you know, stupidest question award to folks and, you know, get them to overcome this, this idea that um, they have to be the smartest person in the room. And I think, you know, among academics, you know, we, we academics, we, we get very embarrassed if, if we're sitting amongst our peers and, you know, we don't know something. And, and, uh, and so, you know, MBAs, they sort of have to cultivate this pride in, in being the ignorant one in, in the room. And I think this is, if you think about the folks who go to work for McKinsey and, and Bain and so forth, I mean, obviously they're, they may be overconfident and so forth, but, you know, having this ability to just be parachuted down into an industry and to ask the right questions so that you can kind of size up the situation. That to me is kind of the, the ideal with respect to what we're trying to produce in MBAs, where I always say that they are, they get a PhD in common sense, right? And you know, the generalists uh, basically are the bosses of the specialists. Um, and I think that's true in business, but it's not true in, in say, in medicine. And, and there's lots of fields where the 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 specialists sort of have m more prestige do, do we need to kind of you know rearrange how we assign prestige to the, these different forms of of knowledge and inquiry um that's a good question and and uh you know we grapple with this at the economist um because for a long time we've hired basically people we think uh even if they're specialists people we think can be turned into generalists um, mm -hmm. And one of the questions we've asked ourselves is whether that's correct. And actually, if when we're increasing our coverage of China, do we just want to hire more and more China specialists because learning Chinese is, you know, really hard? Um, and so, is is that the kind of thing where our historical approach uh, might not be the right one? So we do we ask ourselves this question. I think actually you want a mixture of of people, um, some of whom are extreme, you know, specialists, and some of whom are extreme generalists. Um, where that fits in with management, I mean, the classic problem is that when you're good at thing X, you get put in charge of people doing thing X. Yeah. And being good at thing X is not the same as being able to manage, let alone manage people doing thing X. And, you know, journalism, like many other businesses, we, we don't really get training in management. And in journalism, um, if you're good at it, you get made 
into an editor and um, then you're editing other people's stuff. Um, and one of the good things about The Economist, again, something quite unusual, is that nearly everybody is both a writer and an editor. And so um, we we don't have the sort of uh, division between those two groups that you see at a lot of American publications, for example, where the, um, the, you know, the writers you know, wish they had the power of the editors and the editors wish they had the freedom of the writers. Um, and at The Economist, we have a very flat organisation and we all sort of stand in for each other quite often. And, you know, we all write and we all edit and every piece gets passed around to lots of people for comments. And um, and so so we, we kind of avoid that problem um, to a certain extent, I think. But yeah, in medicine, you do want, you know, for a certain kind of heart surgery, of course you want the specialist who's done hundreds of those kinds of operations and... and um, uh, you know, you don't want the the generalist who's tried all sorts of uh, of different things. So, um, so it really does it really does depend on the on the field, doesn't it? Well, also, I mean, in the and there's the broader is, question is... about whether academia. Sorry, uh, and then there's the broader question about whether academia is you know by by making people be more and more specialised is that actually useful? And are we ending up with people who say, well, you know, my my doctorate is in this aspect of the history of the French Revolution between these two years, and you know, and, and, and there is a sort of active debate about whether whether we're going sort of too far down these rabbit holes. But I love this stuff, and, and uh, you know, going down rabbit holes, you know, as a tourist, as it were, is what I like to do. So when other people have drilled the rabbit holes, that's fine with me. Yeah, as long as you leave the ladder in there, so you can get get back out and <laughs> see what's going on outside mm -hmm. of it. But I mean, the Economist has, I think, is known for it, having you know, no mastheads or very few mastheads. And so, I mean, you know, is that what, the, is that the proper term for the name of the author? Well, it's, right? it's bylines, it's bylines. Bylines. Yeah, right. yeah. so we very don't, we have, we have bylines in a very, in a very few situations. So we have them, if you write a special report, which is a 10 page piece in the middle uh, of the paper mm -hmm. on a single topic, uh, you get a byline for that. Um, and then for the annual, which I edit, um, we have bylines in that because we also have external con contributors. So we have guest writers and we, you know, in the past we've had writers from other publications and so on. So, And then we're also, the anonymity is sort of fraying around the edges in a few other places as well. We're not anonymous in our podcasts or in our videos, um, but we think that's quite useful because we think it's useful to sort of, you know, show people behind the scenes. And we know that economist readers like sort of seeing behind the scenes. Um, so we kind of get to have our cake and eat it because the, uh, the anonymity means that we feel we are all collectively responsible for every piece and if I'm at a publication with bylines and I see the guy on the desk next to me who you know I, w I want to get promoted over him he's making a big mistake but it doesn't matter because it's going out on his byline so let him make the mistake yeah. um, and then he'll look like an idiot and then I get the promotion um, at The Economist no bylines means that um, you know we all feel much more of a sense of responsibility that every piece that um, you know, that we see and we touch needs to be as good as we can make it by the deadline. So um, uh, that is, a, I think, uh, is great. The other thing is that historically, most newspapers didn't have bylines. You've got a byline as a reward for a very good piece. And there's just been rampant byline inflation in the last few decades. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's so much a part of the brand of The Economist now, the anonymity that um, uh, that it's not going to, uh, that's not going to change. But yeah, there are places around the edge on social media, on, on podcasts and videos where you can see who is actually operating things behind the scenes but by creating that distinctive style it means that we can now ask that all of the things we write be written in the style of the economist uh using chat gpt which is uh hopefully you guys are, are not not doing that right you're not using chat well GPT funnily enough we have been things. experimenting we've been no we're not yeah. using it to write but we have built a we have built a, we've been experimenting with language models and one of the language mm -hmm. model experiments we were doing uh, we've been doing is on the style so you give it a uh, uh, you you basically train the system. You fine tune it using the um, the style and using a whole load of economist articles, and then you give it a piece that's not in the style yeah. and say what's wrong with it, and it'll say too much use of the passive voice, and you've done this, and you've used that word, and there's too many long words, and this sentence is too long, and so um, you know we're experimenting with whether that's a way of. Um, helping people come up to speed with learning the style. Because um, so, originally The Economist was, um, uh, you know, written all by one person, James Wilson, who founded it in 1843, he wrote the whole thing. And um, so, but he, but because he didn't have a byline, you couldn't tell it was all one person. So the anonymity allowed um, one person to appear to be many. And today the anonymity allows many people to appear to be one because the um, copy is all edited into this, uh, you know, very specific style. And once you learn the style, you're, 
copy doesn't get changed very much and it's you know you can hit the target and it just sails through editing and it's it's all fine but when you're first learning and when i started you know 25 years ago i learned the style because the page proofs the paper page proofs that of my articles would go through various editors who would scribble on it and i would see what they were changing because they had scribbled on the page when you do everything on a screen like we do now you, the changes people have made are invisible and so you don't have that sort of natural learning mm. process of um you know, oh, there's a dangling modifier. I mean, I remember that when I wrote my first book, it was um, it was full of dangling modifiers, and the editor she drawn a line around every single one and wrote "is dangler" in the margin in pencil. And so I learned what a dangling modifier was, and I've not done them since. And I've also become very sensitised to seeing them, you know, everywhere, and they are everywhere. Um, so, so that kind of you know that use of uh, language models, I think, is you know that's something that we're exploring, which is can we use them to make it easier for people to learn the style when they first join us. So this would be like auto tune, right? For for writing, essentially. Right? <laughs> yes, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, except auto tune kind of has an aesthetic all of its own, which I have to say I'm not a big fan of. But um, um, but you know that's the. It's not just correcting the, the the fact that the pitch is off. It's also making it sound that way that you know some people like. So um, I I, th I suppose the equivalent to that would be a sort of parody economist style, where everything right. is you know the need for structural reform all the time. But, well, you know, in, but in writing on the wall, writing on the wall, you know, you talk about sort of the rise and fall of this sort of centralized uh, media model, and and you know, I think yeah. perhaps it's it's it would be an exaggeration to say that the centralized media model is dead, given the power that the platforms have to channel different pieces to different people. But but the 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 idea, I mean, there's been quite a bit of. Um, panic uh, in journalism circles around the you know pursuit of clicks and the pursuit of of attention and the concern that yeah. this sort of detached and objective uh media model with professional journalists is is on the decline um i mean is is that is that also sort of excessive in terms of its panic mongering i mean certainly the subjective well, no, I've, impression I have to say, you get is I, that I, yellow journalism's on the rise right yeah yeah no, i mean um the the line i've always taken on this is that sort of click driven internet journalism was never a good business model in the first place um and it, it's only got worse since so um i've been making that case for quite a long time the problem with the click driven journalism is that um is that you just give people more of what they clicked on before and what uh, I mean, you know, we're in a we're in an unusual position. The Economist has always got most of its revenue from subscriptions. We have quite a high subscription price because basically, we have people who don't have much time but have enough money. Um, they pay us to save them time. Um, they mm -hmm. and getting up to speed quickly on what's happening in the world is the service we provide to our readers, and they pay us money for that information directly. And there isn't an intermediary. There aren't, you know tech platforms and advertisers and clicks in the middle but the other thing they're paying us to do is to sort of curate what's happened tell them what's important um and very often that's something like you know have you noticed what's happened to the economy of venezuela that's not something that's not a very clickbaity subject but you know essentially that um responsibility we have to our readers which is tell you what's important that you didn't know you needed to know about you're never going to get that with a click driven model with a click driven model you say well look, everyone's clicking on pictures uh, on articles about elon musk electric cars um you know china what time is the super bowl and we're just going to do more of that and if we just did more of what people had clicked on before then we wouldn't be doing our job from, from our perspective um so yeah for, so we've never had a sort of click click-driven model and I've always said well the problem with the click-driven model is firstly it distorts those sort of journalistic incentives but then the other problem with it is just that even if you could make a click-driven model work um, you're basically mortgaging your future to the platform that is sending you the clicks um, we saw this when you know Facebook uh, pivoted to video and lots of people switched to making lots of video content and um, the problem is that if you can make money doing that then at any point the platform in the middle can say, well, actually, we've decided to change the terms and now we're going to have a bit more of that money and you can't do anything about it. And we've seen this happen so many times. And I've been you know, quite gloomy about the prospects for ad supported 
um, internet media for quite a long time. Um, and this year, we've you know sadly seen Buzz uh, Buzzfeed News go under and Vice go bankrupt. And you know, I think both of them have actually done some very good journalism. Um, but ultimately, that business model of um, you live and die by how many clicks you get uh, is not, a, I don't think, a sustainable business model. Um, because even if you can make it sustainable, then as soon as you start making money, someone will come along and say, right, I'll have that. Um, but that said, I'm also, I, I also find, and I've sort of stopped going to, you know, future of journalism, future of media conferences, because they always end up in the same discussion, which is, we used to get all this money from advertising. Um, so, you know, the peak was 2008, 87% of American publications revenue came from advertising. That was the peak mm -hmm. in 2008. Um and since then, it, all that advertising money has gone to Facebook and Google. That money is rightfully ours. We have a God-given, you know, right to, to have that money and to, uh, you know, and therefore they should compensate us for taking away our business model. Now, this is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you know, if you can't apply this this kind of logic, you know, this this profit is rightfully mine. And how dare you take it away? Um you know, that's that's just nonsense. So um, I don't buy it. And we see these very weird sort of um, convoluted attempts to tax tech companies and give the money to uh, media companies. And there's this example going on in mm -hmm. Canada right now where there's this ridiculous law that if you um, if you are a big tech company defined in such a way that it means Facebook or Google and you um, and you you publish a link to some websites but divide it in such a way that it's basically news outlets then you need to pay them um and the law has to tie itself in so many have... knots yeah they tried it in australia too australia. exactly yeah. right and, and and in fact this sort of thing you know charging the charging the um uh the tech platforms to link to the to the to the news companies and they tried this in spain um and google just shut down google news in spain because it just said this is stupid we're not going to do it and then the publishers were all like oh no well our traffic's gone away this is terrible <laughs> well of course it did because they benefited from the you know, they were they were net beneficiaries from from google so so i just you know it drives me absolutely nuts and if you want to subsidize the media and you want to subsidize it subsidize it by taxing tech companies then fine impose a tax on tech companies and then separately introduce a subsidy for the media but this kind of linkage between the two that the tech companies are responsible for the sad state of the of the news industry which has a sort of god-given right to a certain amount of profit just because it used to have that profit for a you know a few decades there i mean you know this is this is crazy thinking really it's like electric cars have come along and therefore no one wants to buy petrol cars anymore so we need to tax electric car companies and give the money to the to the uh, the companies that make the petrol car i mean it, it, you know this is it's nonsense um so i'm just very frustrated by this and you know for years when i did go to those those sorts of conferences about the future of news and everything eventually someone would get up and say well the real problem is that google and facebook have taken all our profits so what we really need to do is etc they need to write us a check basically and uh, you know at that point i would just want to leave the room so and on several occasions did um so yes i'm ah, that drives me nuts <laughs> Well, well, forgive me if I do ask you a question about the future of media, because it seems like, you know, with, you know, the more hackers you have, the, the more demand there is for cybersecurity. And so, you know, the more deep fakes and so forth that we're going to see, presumably the more demand there will be for, for credibility and for, for curation. So, I mean, is this, is this going to be sort of a, a, you know, a winner take all sort of market, right? Because credibility is something that's, that's, you know, it's pretty hard to achieve. It's hard so to we achieve, have, easy to lose. We have seen that dynamic. Yeah, no, we've seen that dynamic in other markets. So famously, food brands first emerged in the sort of 18th, 19th century because of concern about contamination. Um, and we basically have a very noisy and contaminated, polluted news environment now. So I think um, there is certainly a sort of uh, a prospect of a flight to quality and that means trusted media brands and that could include subscription-based media brands like the new york times and the economist but it could also mean um you know uh, state-funded media like the bbc um so i think that there is a sort of optimistic um view there uh, there are questions about equity so you know the guardian has this interesting model where it's basically donation funded uh, and that way they can keep their 
uh, information free to everyone. I didn't think that was going to work when they launched it. I wanted to be proved wrong, and I'm very happy to say that I have been. Uh, and I myself subscribe to the Guardian, you know, voluntarily. I could read it all for free, but I actually give them, you know, I give them their mm-hmm. fifty six pounds a year or whatever it is, um, because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, so, th- but there is this question of, you know, if everything becomes a subscription paywalled media, then you know, what does that mean for the role of media in democracy? So I think there's a real a real problem there. Um, but just going back to the, I mean, the, the writing on the wall thesis. So my thesis about media is that um, most media was social media. So people got news from, you know, friends, acquaintances, gossip in the marketplace, uh, you know, going back thousands of years. And I, I think that, you know, the, that sort of widespread exchange of information um, on a large scale in written form starts with the Romans and the letters of you know people like Cicero. And they're, you can see in Cicero's letters, because we have basically his inbox and his outbox, mm-hmm. you can see that they're all copying letters to each other. And weirdly, my daughter is doing a an email version of this, publishing the letters of Cicero on the days that he sent or received them, on the day of the year that he sent or received them. And she's some, somewhere in 45 BC right now, I think. Um, or was it 44 BC? It's after the assassination of Caesar. So um, anyway, um, but the point is that back in the day, um, you knew that that information might be unreliable. You were just getting it from people. And then what happens in the 19th century is that new technologies that can disseminate information in really large quantities become available. First, we get the steam press and you get the first newspapers with more than a thousand, more than a million um, circulation. Um, And then you get radio and then you get TV. And of course, initially, radio and TV are analog technologies and you have limited bandwidth. So, you know, I grew up in Britain uh, with three TV channels when I was young. And I remember when the fourth one launched, what a big deal it was. Um, And the thing is that when you have a limited... um, you know, when you have access to one of those channels, um, it basically is in your interest to make sure that the information you publish is accurate because you want to preserve your the integrity of your brand. Um, and if you own one of the few a handful of brands and you have you know part of this oligopoly of information, then um, then you know you don't want to you don't want to contaminate that. Um, and so there was a sort of self reinforcing mechanism um, to to try and be accurate and try and not get things wrong. And I think for the most part, when I was growing up, you know, the stuff we saw on telly and the stuff you read in the papers was mostly right um, because it was expensive to publish it in the first place. So just making stuff up and publishing it was not a very you know, good it was, business. It was model. really an industrial, what happened it was, now, it was an industrial organization story, right? <laughs> Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, if you go and see a printing press, I mean, it is, you know, one of the things that we make journalists do when they join The Economist is go and see the printing press because we want to just, we want you to see what the consequences are when we have to stop the presses to fix a mistake. It's like a massive, massive thing. Um, but anyway, uh, so you, we have this period which I call the mass media parenthesis, and it runs from sort of 1850 or so to about 2000. And then the internet makes publishing free again, um, and you have infinite numbers of digital channels and so forth. Um and so we've kind of gone back to, this is the thesis of um, of the writing on the wall book, we've gone back to a, a world where you get information from all sorts of people, some of whom are unreliable or actively trying to mislead you, which was the case, you know, for most of history. Um, so it's not that, you know, it's not like we haven't seen this before. And there have been debates about this for a very long time about, you know, whether it's sensible to have a free press, you know, during the English Civil War, there was this explosion of publishing in, 18, in 1642, because the uh, authority of the king collapsed. And and, you know, it, this was that was the origin of many aspects of the modern free speech debate. You know, is it better to let people publish things even if they're wrong? Let truth and falsehood grapple, Milton, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, so that um, th- we've returned to that world. And I my sort of way of thinking about this is I don't think you, this isn't an engineering problem. You can't fix disinformation, I don't think. Um, I think what you have to do is you have to just go we have to switch our mindset back to the default is that you can't trust anything that you read um, or see or watch. You have to just, you know, like back in the day, uh, everything could just be made up and wrong. Um, And you have to ask what the provenance of everything you see is. And one of the nice things um, about getting information directly from Netflix or directly from the New York Times or directly from The Economist is you're getting it straight Mm -hmm. onto your screen from their app. There is no platform in the middle. There are no Russians in the middle. (laughs) There are no intermediaries, algorithms. Um, And so I think getting information in that direct way, directly from someone who you pay and who you trust, um, is something that, you know, we're likely to see more of. 
Um, and swimming in the in the seas of misinformation is something we'll go and do sometimes, but we'll do it very aware. You know, it's like swimming in a polluted sea with all sorts of dodgy things floating around and sharks and you know sewage and, and things like that. Um, so you know, as long as as long as you are aware of the dangers and as long as you are thinking about the provenance of things, um, then you can do that. But then you need the skills to be be aware of those dangers. So I think that's the kind of mindset shift that we need to go through that we haven't gone through. Now, I think it was it was Reed Hoffman who said. Um, you know, we, we have a tendency to overestimate the amount of change that's going to happen in the next 10 years, but then we underestimate, underestimate how much is going to happen in the next 20 years or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the... It's quite a common... Uh, I've heard various versions of that. Bill Gates has said it too. But yes, we, we underestimate... We overestimate change in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. So we think that everything's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and actually, chat GPT is not going to take everyone's jobs tomorrow. But, you know, AI is going to have a big impact over the next 10 years. And it's much harder to see what that's going to be. So instead, we fixate on the, oh, my God, we're all going to be out of a job tomorrow because of this. Um, and so we end up being sort of wrong on on both dimensions. Well, maybe we can switch and talk about this book on motion. I mean, we, we, we tend to say, oh, you know, level five autonomy is right around the corner. I know Elon Musk has been saying this, but I remember when I, when I in 2006, my house burned down and all my CDs were damaged, uh, you know, by the water um, that came in. So my, you know, the CDs were intact, but the, the little wrapper was, you know, oh, the slip destroyed. cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all moldy and stuff. And so I was like, what am I going to do? And I had 4,000 CDs. And um, so everyone was like, oh, you should, you know, upload them into a, you know, hard drive and then you can access them through your iTunes and everything. And there's a company that if you send them off for a dollar a piece, they'll like, you know, upload them for you and everything. And I said, oh, no, no, we're going to have streaming like any day. I'll be able to stream this stuff. And here it is, you know, uh, I don't know how many years later, 15 years later. And. Um, we still most a lot of that music is still not available uh, for for streaming, and you know it was really? only just this I figured, year that okay. Well, I mean, well, it was only it was only just this year that that Apple introduced sort of you know classical right Apple classical, which doesn't treat a movie. No, well, like a no, song they had classical so before. The, yeah, they had classical before. The problem is that uh, all the streaming services are set up for pop music. I speak as yeah. the son of a classical violinist, um, and so they're they're like like artist track name album name. That's the way it works. Yeah. And so composer is not there. And then the idea that there are multiple versions of the Four Seasons or Rack Two, right. uh, you know. So so all that all Apple Classical is is basically a better interface for you exactly. know that that stuff is there, but it was just hard to find. But yeah, no, I think I think there, those sorts of um, changes. I mean, we. We forget. Um, I, 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 I'm constantly struck by this. The 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 friction that used to be in life, you know, with like for example, getting lost, uh, having mm -hmm. maps. I remember when we used to drive to Europe in the summer, we'd have all these map books. And, oh you know, yeah. And the Big first Michelin year maps. we had a sat nav. Yeah, exactly. And the first year we had a sat nav was an absolute revelation because we could just dial in where we wanted to go and it would say how long. And then we'd go, oh, actually, we'd like to go to this place on the way. And we'd just have to stop and, and we wouldn't get lost. And it was just like amazing. And now we can't, you know, imagine a world where, where that would happen. And then similarly, so I'm constantly thinking like, what are the what are the kinds of friction? So similarly with music, you could you, you used to have to buy albums without having heard them. Mm -hmm. um, now you can just listen to everything and you can just say, well, I've never really known about the music of this band. So I'm just going to go and listen to all their albums. It's wonderful. I absolutely love it. So that's another source of friction that's gone away. Commuting, we didn't realise that was a source of friction, but it turns out we don't have to do that anymore. Or at least some of us don't have to do it quite so much anymore. Um, so we get we get time back from that. So I'm constantly looking for like, what are the things that, uh, you know, that we're doing now um, that are the sources of friction that are going to go away? Um, and, and you know, I'm I'm constantly thinking about those as sort of ways that the world might change. Well, I mean, in the book, you 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 make you show how there were frictions for the adoption of the automobile, and we see those frictions today for the adoption of of autonomy and EVs. But it's it's often not where you think it is, right? So you know, the the problem right now is presumably not the development of ever more sophisticated machine learning algorithms for you know, recognizing what's happening in the environment because it may be the friction is how do we adjust the environment so that it's easier for the, them to understand by building, you know, ring fenced areas or, you know, the friction has to do with the, the legal resistance. And, you know, we need to make sure that it's a thousand times safer before, you know, we're willing to allow it to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to operate. No, that's right? very much that, that approach of, um, make the environment uh, friendlier to the autonomous cars is very much what's happening in China. But I should say, I mean, this book is um, is only tangentially about autonomous cars. It's really about mm -hmm. the um, 
it's it's about the fact that I mean it's a whole history of it starts literally with the wheel um but then it's really about the rise of the car and how the car bent the world out of shape um mm -hmm. and uh and how that didn't really that kind of happened by accident and in some cases because of lobbying by the car industry but it's a sort of parable of 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 technological adoption and in particular the kind of recurring theme is this idea of path dependency which is once you start doing something it's very very hard to switch to doing something else and we kind of had this path dependency with with um horses and the book starts with this analogy between the present day and the 1890s because in the 1890s uh there was this big problem with the uh the transport the dominant form of urban transport was completely environmentally unsustainable and it was horse because manure. of horses and horse manure horse manure was everywhere but also the horse intensity of big cities like london and new york was going up so the the number of horses per capita was increasing every year and you'd have thought that you know introducing trains would help but actually trains made it worse mm -hmm. because the more people you've got coming in and out of a city on a train the more you need horse-borne transport to move the people and the goods you know for the last mile and so this was something that people were recognizing in the 1880s and 1890s and there are all these fights where you know women are campaigning against the horse manure dumps in their neighborhoods which stink and you know uh, there's flies and they're worried about the health impact and it's it's terrible and the streets are just like open sewers and it's just completely disgusting and then the car comes along and everyone is like oh this is going to fix everything cars are going to take up less space on the road because you know a horse and a carriage is like this and a car takes up half as much space so that means we're going to have twice as much road space and therefore traffic will stop being a problem because mm -hmm. traffic was a massive massive problem as well horses were kind of getting in the way of trams and you know all the rest of it um and then it was going to stop solve you know there wouldn't be car crashes anymore there wouldn't be accidents um because you know horses can bolt they can run away they can kick you cars are completely predictable so that's going to not be not be a problem and then the pollution problem will go away as well because cars don't poo and of course cars do poo they poo carbon dioxide and it turns out we were wrong on all counts um you didn't park horses on the street but people started parking cars on the street and that became normal and then we just ended up building these dormitories for cars that we call cities um and you know the amount of parking in america is you know 40 percent of big big u.s cities is is parking and all this kind of stuff yeah, um, so uh so there are all these sort of unintended consequences from what looked like a silver bullet and what i'm saying is here we are again and we're sort of saying well electrifying cars um is you know that's a similar analogy because they they the horseless carriage was like it's just the same you just take away the horse everything else will be the same or better and actually electric cars are kind of a different beast uh, because they're computers on wheels and they have all sorts of you know implications and then if you can make them autonomous as well and, and that's the you know the, a lot of the same silver bullet arguments are being advanced about autonomous cars that they're going to get rid of pollution they're going to get rid of traffic they're going to get rid of accidents and maybe they will but um the lesson of history is they probably won't and even if they do there will be other unintended consequences consequences like the fact that you know cars are basically moving camera platforms and so you know it's a massive surveillance system <laughs> you know the first thing that's going to happen in the future when the crime is committed is the police are going to ask nearby cars what they saw um and, and this kind of thing so um you know there's a sort of data exhaust uh, problem uh that uh you know might catch us out so i I'm, I'm really sort of telling the parable of how how the car ended up being quite so influential as a technology in the 20th century and saying that these apparently inconsequential choices that were made along the way that then fossilized into this enormous mm -hmm. car infrastructure we we have to be very careful that we don't go uh, and fall into the same sorts of traps again as we redesign our transport architecture now and that's not just avs it's you know it's using uber or you know ride hailing in general it's electric vehicles it's uh it's bikes it's what can we do about road safety we can rethink um, the architecture of cities because we don't have to have cars as the main you know roads don't just have to be things for cars to drive on and we saw a lot of this in the pandemic where we had um pedestrianized streets and a lot of cities have left you know, they've added bike lanes, they've left areas pedestrianised. And it turns out you can have a much better quality of life if you have fewer cars. Um, it, obviously, you need to have decent public transport to make this work, uh, which is a problem in a lot of America. But in in much of Europe, you know, city centres have been pedestrianised and it's it's fantastic. Um, so I'm really kind of looking at that whole complex of uh, sort of interaction. And this is, you know, going back to the start. Um, essentially, what I'm interested in is the social um, impact of technology and food is technology and cars are a technology and media is a technology um, and you know these are all it's all the same joke over and over again which is how people react to things and um, and what can we learn from the way people reacted in the past so that we don't make the same mistakes in the future well I mean the lesson I got from the book um, on motion was really it's kind of a um, argument against ceteris paribus thinking right so you know this is what we, we as economists we're always like okay 
um, let's take this one variable in isolation and, um, you know, see what happens if we change it. And the expectation is that everything else will stay the same and this one thing will change, right? So, yeah, exactly. For instance, yeah, you know, if, if, we, if we have autonomous vehicles, well, then, you know, we'll have less traffic. And, and you talk about there's this one experiment, right, where um, people were given access to sort of a fake uh, autonomous vehicle, like a show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's car. wonderful. It's wonderful, and, yes. And, and then they start using it like all the time. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I now have a job at, at Stanford. Um, and, it, I, you know, if, if this were, if I had to drive there, I mean, I would seriously consider moving because I live in Berkeley. Um, but now that I, I take Uber every day, you know, when I go down, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not even thinking about moving. Right. <laughs> so, cause I, my, my belief is I yeah, hate yeah. commuting. I like, I like walking to work, but if I got somebody chauffeuring me, you know, it's not that much, really, it's not that bad. It's not that inconvenient. I can read my books and so forth in, in the car. And so yeah, that, that experiment so may... was, was hilarious. I was, mm-hmm. and it was also in California. Um, I can't remember which university did it, but, um, but yes, it's kind of a version of the lump of labor fallacy, which is that there's a lump of transport. Um, and, uh, if you automate the cars, then it, uh, everything, everything stays the same. It's just, there are no drivers and, uh, we know this is wrong, but yeah, that experiment, they basically gave people, um, in California, in San Francisco, I think they gave them, um, 24 hour chauffeured car and they said, you can just get into it and say, I want to go to here and we'll see what happens. And the idea was to explore the idea of induced demand, which is when you've got a car that can drive you, you're going to start using it in a different way for example you might say well i want to go to that you know that town over there that's five hours away um i'm just going to tell my car to go there and sleep in the car um and right. if you can do that you're probably going to travel more um and if you can send your car to pick up your kid from school and then come back again and you don't have to go that's really convenient um so you might do that more often than if you actually had to drive yourself and it took time out of your day so there's this idea of induced demand um and we, that we have you know we're used to this if you build a road people look at an empty road and go well, look at an empty road i'll drive on that so the more roads you build the more traffic you get and the the version of this with um uh with autonomous vehicles is that if you make autonomous vehicles then people might actually travel a lot more than they travel now and so um, this experiment found exactly that which is that uh, in particular if you want to go to wine country you know that's an hour and a half two hours north of san francisco and then you're going to drink a whole load of wine you're not going to be in a state to come home but if you've got a car that can drive itself you're going to do that every sunday right you're going to go right off we go to wine country take me to all these wineries yes i'm going to get completely hammered and then i'm going to sleep in the car on the way home and so they found that the number of miles that people drove or traveled when they had these you know in effect self-driving vehicles went up Mm -hmm. by a factor of seven or something it was absolutely terrifying so again that was evidence against the um you know autonomous cars will get rid of traffic um because actually they could massively increase it because people would mm. uh would send you know i'm going to send my car to pick something up for me from a shop um and i'd never bother to you know i wouldn't do that myself if i was driving but um you know if my car can do it itself so there are all these extra use cases that you know that we need to we need to be aware of and then the other the other amusing um i think sort of thread that runs through the book is the rise and fall the idea that you are what you drive um and yeah. this is very very ancient and we have pictures of you know of, of, of egyptian pharaohs on their war chariots because the war chariot was like the coolest vehicle in the world when it was invented and then um and then what happens is that after um, about around the kind of battle of Gorgomeda, so uh, Alexander the Great, fourth century BC, um, and Alexander's cavalry completely destroys the Persians who are who are using chariots, and then chariots, um, uh, you know, start to become. Uh, they're basically regarded as women's vehicles, uh, uh, wheeled vehicles. And in the Roman period, uh, you know, men go around on horses and, and women go in vehicle uh, uh, in wheeled vehicles. And um, and then by the sort of you know Middle Ages, we get the uh, the the knight on on horseback and the princess in the carriage. And this is very much you know it was regarded as extremely unmanly um, to be seen in a in a vehicle in a wheeled vehicle. It was all right for servants to go in them, but you know real men rode horses. Um, and then it all changes again when gunpowder weapons are invented and suddenly you can shoot the people on the horses but you can mount the gunpowder weapons on the back of carriages and then suddenly things with wheels are cool again and so there's this complete flip uh in sort of the 16th century and suddenly riding a horse um riding uh, being able to drive a, a coach and horses very very fast becomes manly again um so there's this sort of constant seesawing of of you know the, you are defined by your vehicle whether it's got wheels or, or whether it's a horse or or, or whatever um 
And that's sort of something we take for granted today. It's interesting to see that starting to decline. You know, younger people seem to be driving less. And in some big cities, you know, places like Tokyo, where it's a total nightmare to have a car, the smartphone became the kind of defining social technology, um, you know, a long time ago. But we're seeing that happen in the West. And, you you know, a, a, a smartphone is very much a substitute for a car because you can use it to call up, you know, transport. You can use it as a travel pass. You can go shopping through your phone instead of having to go to the mall. You can make food appear through your phone instead of having to, you know, drive somewhere um and so uh, you know i would like to think that that sort of you know finally puts a skewer in the idea that you're defined by what kind of car you have but you know old habits die hard and that's a very very old habit yeah when you made that comparison between the kind of car as status symbol and the phone as status symbol you know it reminded me of i teach this course in my strat i teach this case in my strategy class about coca-cola and of course you know in your book on the beverages right you got a whole chapter on coca-cola and I used to teach the class as, you know, the, the substitute that was supplanting Coca-Cola was, you know, bottled water, right? In the same way in your, in your book, you, you know, you talk about bottled water. But then I, I recently it occurred to me, and I was talking to the head of marketing for, for, for Coke, who was a former student of mine, and he said, no, 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 the, the biggest competitor to Coke is the iPhone, right? And that, you know, Coke used to be hydration plus coolness. And now... The coolness comes from the phone, you know, not just in the U.S., but, of course, all around the developing world, right? The first thing you did when the wall fell is, you know, you go get a Coke. And, and now, of course, you know, the first thing yeah, you yeah. do when you get any kind of prosperity is you buy the phone. And so, you know, the decline of Coca-Cola as a, as a, as a beverage is, is really tied to the rise of, of, the, of the smartphone. And, and, and that, that had never occurred to me. And now, of course, I, I teach that <laughs> in, 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 my, in my class. Um, and, I, and I think, the, look, the main the main th- sort of lesson that I get from all of your books is this idea of it's a type of humility I think that you're trying to cultivate in the uh, in the reader you know the, this humility around forecasting and this humility around um, you know consequences of of shocks and, and interventions um, and it's it is very similar to what you get when you read a lot of Phil Tetlock right <laughs> it's this idea that yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. maybe we should be, be, exactly. pre- be prepared all... to be surprised yeah, no, I think I think that's I think that's reasonable, and I think um, sort of you can prepare yourself to be surprised by seeing how people were surprised in the past. So, you know, when the telegraph first started operating, and people said, "Oh my God, it's black magic," but then at the same time, the operators were like, "We're bored, let's play chess." So they start playing chess, you know, down the line, and you know, they, these were surprising uses of, um, uh, of of the technology. So yeah, I, I think I think that's a reasonable uh, way of looking at it, and I think one of the ways you can prepare for the surprises um, of the future is to sort of think. And look closely at how people were were taken by surprise in the past, and then try try not to get too caught out. And so everybody thought that the biggest impact of Columbus would be gold, and it turned out to be the the potato, right? And and I'm grateful for that. Um, well, a whole Tom, load of things. So I, mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. lots of things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Tom, thanks so much for joining me. It's great. The uh, latest book here is called um, uh, A Brief History of Motion. Uh, check it out. Um, but also Edible History of Humanity, Writing in the Wall, History of the World in Six Glasses, Victorian Internet, The Turk. I hope none of these go out of print because I, I really like all of them and hope that everybody gets a chance to, to read them. And they're all written in, in, the, in the style, which kind of sucks you through just like uh, The Economist does every week. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 